Vermont Futures Project Forum here in Addison County. Uh, and I have to say, this is sort of their third one, and we have um, by far brought the most people to this <laughs> forum of any other county in the state, so go Addison County. Uh, you'll hear more about the project in a few minutes, but uh, this forum is a great opportunity to be part of a statewide discussion series regarding the future of our state of Vermont with a goal of enhancing and sustaining a healthy economy. Before we get to the program itself, just a couple of items I want to note. Um, first, a big thank you to Millbrae College for hosting this event in this gorgeous spot. I hope you will all be looking at the golf course the whole time, but it's a pretty, pretty special place and for the food, so thank you very much to Middlebury College. Um, bathrooms are out this door and to the left if you need those. Um, also want to let you know that we're videoing uh, the plenary sessions of this event. Jennifer Molino from Addison County Economic Development and a member of Middlebury Community Television uh, is our videographer. This will be up on the MCTV website probably next week sometime, and we can get a link out to everybody whose email addresses we have, and I think we have all of yours, so. Uh, and if you don't hear from us, you can check the MCT website, MCTV website and find it there. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, the president of Middlebury College, Lori Patton. Lori is coming up on the end of her first year as president here in Middlebury, and by all accounts, it's been not only a whirlwind year, but also a very successful one. Everyone is thrilled that Lori is now part, part of the college community and our larger community. One of the many reasons for this is that Lori is a firm believer in community partnerships. So it seems especially fitting that she is introducing today's program. Please join me in welcoming Lori Patton. Thank you, Robin, and good morning, everybody. Um, I really am delighted to be here. I heard there was overflow registration almost three times the number that we were expecting, so congratulations to the organizers. Um, the energy here and uh, around Addison County is just really infectious. Um, and I wanted to thank you in particular for being here today uh, to discuss the future of Vermont and how we can work together to create opportunities to build and strengthen our state's economy. I'm really pleased that you've chosen Middlebury as the host for the Addison County Forum of the Vermont Futures Project. And it's really difficult not to be enthusiastic about this project. I was drawn to it from the moment I met Jeff and heard him explain the work that he and Jennifer have undertaken on behalf of the Vermont Chamber of Commerce Foundation. They've gathered data that we will discuss here today that makes the realities and challenges of Vermont's economy its key trends and its economic future very clear. These realities and how we understand them and grapple with their implications are extremely important to us here at Middlebury. I'd like to take a moment to talk about why before handing this off to Jeff and Jennifer, who will explain the key economic indicators that they've compiled and what they mean to us. As you probably know, Middlebury was founded, the college was founded here 216 years ago. To many who live here and come to visit us, it appears to be a picture-perfect example of a classical New England college. Our campus was actually featured on a recent episode of CSI from the top um, about murder and rape on a college campus, and we called them immediately and said, we get it that we're archetypal, but probably you could take that little shot, that aerial shot off, and they obliged, which was very nice of them. Um, and it is, of course, a classical New England college. But it's so much more. Uh, today we are a global enterprise. In addition to the 2,500 students we educate here, more than 700 Middlebury students, and yes, we do consider them to be Middlebury students, are enrolled at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, 3,000 miles from here on the California coast. A lot of people in California are thinking about Vermont, which is kind of a nice idea. And right now, hundreds of students are studying at our school's abroad program in 37 cities and 17 countries. And in the summers, uh, Addison County, thank you, uh, as well as the Middlebury Language Schools, bring students from far and wide to our campus to learn new languages and then go back out into the world to communicate on a wider scale. And the Breadloaf School of English is probably closely associated with the campus in Ripton, but it also has a Campton in New, a campus in New Mexico and another in Oxford, England. So we do prepare our students for life on a global scale, but at the same time, we've never lost touch, and I hope we will get an even closer touch with our deep roots in this town, <coughs> county, and state. 
And it's essential to me and to all of my staff, as well as the people of the college, that we encourage deep commitment and involvement with local life here in Middlebury and Addison County. Our students, faculty, and staff are invested and involved in the community as residents, volunteers, activists, consumers, athletes, and outdoor enthusiasts. And we just had our preview days two days ago, and I love this little statistic. 60% of our students study abroad, 60% of our students volunteer in the community. That's a wonderful sort of match in terms of the global and the local. So when Jeff told me about this initiative, I told him we would support it enthusiastically. The economic vitality of Vermont and the health of Middlebury College are deeply linked. The presidents of Middlebury who preceded me understood this, and I have seen it firsthand already. A vibrant local and state economy helps us recruit and retain faculty and staff who want to live and work here. It helps us attract the students from around the world who want to learn here, and it keeps our alumni engaged with the community as both residents and visitors. And we hope that we have played and will continue to play even more of a role in Vermont's economic development. We are one of the state's largest employers. We generate millions of dollars a year in economic activity, and we bring, as, as all institutions of higher learning in Vermont do, intellectual capital to the area with faculty, staff, and students. We hope that our students at the local level are creative innovators, entrepreneurs, and future owners of businesses large and small. We hope that our alumni connectors at the local level are powerful connectors that improve the lives of everyone here. This greater community partnership between public and private sectors is something we in higher education need to do better. Institutions of higher education in Vermont and around the country need to do a better job of working with those sectors. They're powerful partnerships, and more than that, they're essential. The Cross Street Bridge is one example, opened in 2010. Financing for that $16 million project, which included not only the bridge construction, but also the creation of a roundabout on Main Street, came about through a creative partnership between Middlebury and the college. The town provided $7 million through local option taxes, the college contributed the remaining $9 million, and the project was able to proceed without federal and state funding. I love this story because in learning the early story of Middlebury, um, I understood how much we were the town's college by virtue of the fact that um, it, Middlebury was created uh, in a contest uh, between um, the citizens of Middlebury and those of Burlington to get federal funding um, in the late 18th century, and we lost. And the townspeople just said, well, too bad, we're going to create a college anyway without federal or state funding. So here we are doing the same thing later. Um, and of course, this allowed to bypass the, uh, the state project waiting list that could have delayed construction. So when we partner together, we can accomplish so much more than what we could do alone. And I'm proud to say that we've created three new internships this year with local uh, institutions in the town of Middlebury, and we're looking at doing so much more. I want to thank uh, and encourage everyone here today in discussing economic de de development and going forward to remember that we need to think holistically. We need to think about our partnership with each other and with a remarkable place that we call home. We need to think not just about job creation, not just about workforce preparation, although those are absolutely essential, but also the conditions that lead to prosperity and a more equitable, vital community for us all. So today, I'm really looking forward to the conversation, not only as a president of Middlebury College, but also more importantly, perhaps, uh, equally importantly, as a resident of Middlebury, of Addison County, and of Vermont. Being aware of our challenges, understanding them thoughtfully, mindfully, intelligently conceiving fair and reasonable solutions will benefit all of us. We've seen before how Vermont, though a small state, can be a standard bearer for the country in advancing new ideas and new approaches to seemingly intractable issues. And I hope we can do that again today. So may the work we do here today be part of Vermont's next opportunity to be a leader. May we find new ways to balance our commitments and sustain a robust and growing economy while never losing sight of what makes us love and cherish this place that we've all chosen to call home. Please count on Middlebury Partner as a Middlebury College as a major partner in this endeavor. Thanks very much and welcome.
And now I'd like to introduce the two people who are really running this event and others like it around the state, Jeff Lewis and Jennifer Stromson. Uh, Jennifer began working with Jeff Lewis in 2013 through efforts to mitigate economic losses incurred by the Vermont Yankee power plant closure down in Vernon. Jeff and Jen continue to provide consulting services and research for nuclear host communities adjusting to new economic realities in southern Vermont and to work with organizations and businesses striving to create jobs and investment needed to offset Vermont Yankee losses. Jen has a master's in regional planning at UMass Amherst focused on sustainable economic development for communities. Her research and teaching focus on small-scale infill redevelopment using fiscal impact and tax yield analysis to integrate revenue awareness into land use planning projects. I'm not sure I could say that another way and understand, but she does important research and analysis. She's worked extensively in community-based public participation and planning projects that combine data gathering with advanced qualitative analytical tools to generate recommendations for policymakers. She's most recently done this in Holyoke, Mass, um, and in Amherst, Mass, called Amherst Together. Prior to being a planning, Jen worked as a nonprofit fundraiser building results-driven annual fund programs and volunteer networks. Jeff retired in 2013, again, uh, after eight years as executive director of the Brattleboro Development Corporation, which is where I knew him from the BDCC in Brattleboro when we were colleagues. Um, it's the Regional Development Corporation in Windham County. For the last year, he's been with Jen working for the Vermont Chamber Foundation on this Vermont Futures Project with the goal of invigorating the Vermont economy through research and policy innovation. Prior to retiring to Vermont another time, 13 years ago, he was in reverse order chief customer officer of Monster.com, senior consultant with the Pat Patricia Siebold Group in Boston, technology manager and strategist at Phoenix Life Insurance, and before that, a practicing parish minister. So he has a wide variety of activities. From all those careers emerged a passionate interest in economic development as a community undertaking, requiring a wide variety of skills from research to diplomacy, including real estate management, finance, politics, and survival. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff and Jen and let them get on with the show. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robin. And thank you. Uh, just get organized here. Uh, I, we should make sure that you see Jennifer, who is in the back now waving her hand. <laughs> and next to her is our associate, Daniel Southwell, who will be helping with the flow of uh, activity after this. So we have brought our team to work. Let me uh, talk first about the Futures Project. I'm going to talk about, we're going to, a little bit about the theory underneath what we're doing. Well, I want to call it theory, but the explanation for why we're doing things the way we are. We'll touch on some data, but I hope you've had a chance to look at uh, vtfuturesproject.org, uh, which is where all of our data is. Jennifer uh, curated all of that, working with some professional researchers to get the right data, and we'll continue to update that over the next 10 to 15 years. The Chamber Foundation is, is committed to keeping that up to date so that we always have data to talk about. Vermont has, as you know, plenty of opinion. We thought data might be useful. <laughs> So today, I'm going to give an overview of the Futures Project. I'm going to think a little bit about the economy, some of the history, and what, the, what that's caused for us in terms of the way Vermont approaches things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the data and how we look from the data. And then we're going to talk about a vision. And I'm going to come back to why we're talking about a vision. But we think that building a vision is really important. And vision to us is not high-flown and distant, rather it's, and we'll say this several times, what do we want to see when we open the door in 15 years? What do you want to see out there? What kinds of people, what kinds of businesses, what kinds of opportunities? So we like to make it practical. Then we can talk about how we get there, what values we need to share along that road, what kinds of strategies, but vision as a practical expectation, outcomes is what we need to talk about. So the Vermont Futures Project, briefly, with board member here, Steve Terry. So if you have complaints, they go to him, not to me. <laughs> the Vermont Chamber of Commerce created the foundation as a nonprofit research entity, so we are 
affiliated with the chamber, but quite separate. We have a separate board, we're a separate entity. We are a 501c3. There are other similar foundations in state chambers, notably North Carolina, Kentucky, and Florida that have been doing similar kinds of research and strategy work for a number of years, so there's a well-established pattern here. But the goal, as President Patton said, is long-term attention to the economy. Spanning administrations, Vermont has, as you know, a two-year political cycle, which tends to mean that there are relatively short-term attention spans to policy, to problems, et cetera, and so forth. We think it's crucial in this time for there to be long-term strategy, long-term persistent attention to programs, strategies, goals. So we describe this as a data-driven initiative to secure the economic future and provide opportunity. So economic success is opportunity for our people. It's not just big employers, it's not just high tax revenues, it's opportunity that satisfies Vermonters. The phases, phases of the project, briefly, the first one is complete, and that's the data which is published at uh, vtfuturesproject.org. We published that on January 8th. There's about 90 indicators in there, or 90 uh, pieces of data. There's about 30 indicators. I'll come back to those in a little bit. The second thing we're going to do is build a vision. I've talked about that. You'll hear about that a lot, but that's part of what today is about. We'll try and complete that for this summer. We're doing 10 of these events around the state. This is the largest, and we suspect the best. But I know that Chittenden County sent some spies down to kind of see how things go here. So there is competition, and we like competition, right? Yeah. Third. Because vision is not enough. Vision is critical, but vision is not enough. We then have to turn vision into very serious policy discussions. How are we going to do the things that we want to do? So we think that the, that the third phase of this, which lasts as long as necessary, as I said, the foundation is committed to 10 to 15 years of work. We think the policy work needs to be substantial, long-term, consistent. So we would essentially, this is a rinse and repeat. You update the data every year or so. You update the vision every two or three years. You continue the policy work to provide a consistent set of policy inputs to policymakers and opinion leaders in the state. So how did vision become part of an economic development project? Usually in economic development, we're talking about investments and assets and employers and employees and labor and workforce and all that stuff. It's because we need to think about something bigger than ourselves, partly because we're hunters, but mostly because we're human. We need to think about something that's bigger than ourselves. We need a way to share not just results for ourselves, but values and goals. Again, as Vermonters, this is critical, but all people share vision or values and goals about what they want to be, what they want their communities to be. We steer by where we want to go, not by where we've been, because if we steer by where we've been, first of all, we're looking backwards. Secondly, we don't have a sense of what's possible. Last, we work harder for things we believe in rather than for things we just want. Or as we say, we need to know, that's why we're building a vision, is we need to know what success looks like feels like. One of the things that we're doing in the, in the foundation is paying attention to public policy, strategy, and plans at the state level because there is not a large conversation going on at that level, but also because there are some really great things going on at what we call the ground level. Here in Addison County, Robin has been doing really interesting things, but there's some great stuff happening in the Madura Valley in Bennington, in Rutland, in Wyndham County, Chittenden. All of these are doing really interesting projects and programs to try and stimulate their economy. But often without a kind of overall strategy that says, this fits in a place that the state itself is pushing and devoting both resources and talent. That's why we think public policy is critical. We also think, we 
said the state legislature, because of the political cycle, tends to be short-term focused, and the current budget crisis has tended to make that real. That is, we need to pay attention to what's happening right now, because we've got a crisis today. We're going to balance this budget, and then, sure enough, next year we've got to balance next year's budget. So we never really get a chance to look very far and say, where are we going to be in 10 years? We're going to talk a little bit about that. That's what we want to think about. Where are we going to be in 10 years or 15 years? There's lots of public policy issues, as you understand, that can drive economic development, infrastructure investment, bridge building, tax policy, housing, how we do permitting, education, how we pay for it, how we deliver it, the quality of what we do with it, both regular K-12 or pre-K-12 and, and higher education, land use, let me talk a little bit about what we call the policy marketplace. This is a critical piece of how we understand how things work. There are basically three sets of values and commitments that communities have. Uh, and this is, we didn't make this up, this is actually a fairly uh, standard view when you come to think about how policy gets developed. Those three really competing or contrasting sets of commitments have to do with the environment. How do we take care of what we inherited? Preservation, conservation, protection. How do we take care of ourselves and our, and our friends and neighbors? How do we deal with social and economic justice? How do we distribute resources and opportunity? But finally, how do we create opportunity? How do we create opportunity and make things better? So there's a three-way conversation here. And this holds in any set of policy-making entity. So this is a kind of way of, of understanding the political discussion that goes on. These are related to one another. And in Vermont, as you can see from some of the labels here, there are well-organized and established advocacy groups that provide uh, views about these. The Environmental Movement, the NRC, Land Trust, Conservation Law Foundation, and many others occupy this corner and have done so well and powerfully for the past 35 years. There is an emerging group like Public Assets, the housing organizations, the whole interest in single payer health care has emerged in the past 10 or 15 years more powerfully, although fairness and economic justice have been a piece of Vermont's history for, for 80 years. That's become more powerful. This, this governor has, has invested a lot of his time and energy in that area, so that's tended to raise the profile a bit. Economic development is represented by industry associations, the Chambers of Commerce, the RDCs that Robin and I work on. Everybody has people who work in favor of advocating or of the uh, forming policy. And in fact, in our legislature, because of the cyclic nature of the two-year cycle, a lot of the policy development actually happens in these extra legislative bodies. Because they have the time, and in some cases, far more resource than even the legislature to affect policy. So it's important to understand these areas of who's affiliated with them and how those discussions happen. There are conflicts between these, as you can imagine. This is what makes it politics and not just a calculation to say, well, we need two of these and one of those and a couple of these, because people in this corner are, are reasonably driven by values for land use and preservation and protection. So they're, they're protective of that. You don't build an industrial park without using some land. <coughs> you don't create jobs without industrial parks or office buildings or places for people to work. So there's a, there's a stress there. There are ways to negotiate and resolve this. That's the political process. But there's stress. Political power matters. But here's what's interesting in Vermont now. We'll switch to Vermont. In Vermont, there's a kind of a shared environmental vision. 
all of these organizations, and we've only listed three, while they are not the same and they have different fo foci in terms of the uh, in terms of the environment, the land trust is clearly focused on land preservation, conservation. Uh, BNRC has some other sort of interest. The uh, conservation law has its own way approach to things. But if you push a little bit, or more precisely, if you walk around the legislature and ask, you know what the environmental vision is for a while? People can tell you. Because for 35 years, we've talked about that. We've built organizations, we've built public policy, we've talked about what we want. Similarly, with social justice, if you walk around and ask, do you know what our vision is for this? Not everybody's going to agree, but they know what that is. <coughs> Within some tolerance. It's our view, mine certainly after having been in the, in the field for 10 years here in Rwanda, that one of the things that's missing in this is this right here. That there is not an equally powerful vision for the, for the state of the economy in Vermont. What does opportunity mean for Vermonters? What does it mean in Vermont to live, to live well, and then to live better? According to how you walk. But to be able to have the opportunity to accomplish what you want with your life and that of your family. This vision is not as clear or as well shared. So part of what we're about here is building this vision amongst us and the other nine meetings we're having, the research we're doing is to build a vision here that we, hopefully all of you when we're done, can share and say, yeah, that's what Vermont needs to have in order to take care of its environment well, to provide social and economic justice, and to provide opportunity to its people. The ones who are here, and the ones who will be here. So that's what we're after. It's actually influencing the public conversation about how policy gets created in Vermont. That's how important this is. This is not just about a couple of programs or projects. This is about really affecting <coughs> The political conversation in Vermont, political meaning the making of policy. We sometimes talk about deals because we look at some of the things that go on in Vermont. And while we have a, a, a permit apparatus and a regulatory apparatus, as many of you know, it's possible to work around those by negotiation by making a deal with a town, or with a developer, or with another group that says, well, we would have opposed you, but we'll support you if you'll donate to this, or contribute to that, or take this on. And those deals happen all the time. Deals are going to happen in the environment, but too many deals suggest that the, that the apparatus is insufficient. We're starting to think that, that, that what we've built is, is no longer strong enough to carry a vision forward, and we think the reason is we don't have a clear enough vision here to be able to say, this is what opportunity looks like, and here's how we have that difficult conversation with people who want to watch our environment. I am not going to pretend that that conversation is going to be made easier by a, by a clearer and stronger economic opportunity vision. It's probably going to be made more complicated. But that's okay. That challenges ourselves and our politicians to do better, to think harder, to solve more difficult problems. That's why we need to be doing policy development, research, generation, and education. Because this is hard work. This is hard. So let's switch gears for a second and talk about how economies grow because we need to grow our economy. It simply needs to be bigger than it is. We don't generate enough revenue to pay all the state's bills. We don't have enough opportunity, and as I'll say in a moment, we don't have enough workforce. 
economies grow and populations grow, more people means more people can work, it means more people consume, economies will get bigger. But economies grow in terms of wealth or in terms of wages, although we've got some challenge with that right now, when productivity grows. And productivity grows from capital investment, from innovation, from change, from challenge, from competition. We need to stimulate those things. Entrepreneurship, of which Middlebury College is the leader in student entrepreneurship, we need to be doing that, both in new businesses but in our existing businesses. And we need to treasure that and invest in it, both the intellectual capital and, frankly, the real capital, the financial capital. The economies grow when the population grows. Vermont's population has not grown in the last 15 to 20 years. Most of you know that already. We're effectively flat. And when a population is effectively flat, it ages. We are a very rapidly aging population. Workforce is a subset of the, dem of the demography. It's not separate. So if the population isn't growing, guess what's true about the workforce? It's not growing. And it's aging. And because opportunity is thin in Vermont, our workforce is actually shrinking. We have people in workforce age who are leaving Vermont for opportunity. Because wages are better elsewhere, or opportunity is better. I was thinking about this one the other day, and I just have to say it. Vermont's population was also relatively flat from 1820 to 1960, which means well, we grew from 1965 to 1995. The last time before that when we grew was when Napoleon was emperor. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to say that. It's just, I couldn't believe it when I realized it. 200 years ago. That's what it's like to be a rural state. Productivity and wages in Vermont are below the U.S. average. So when I said productivity is important to raise wages for companies to grow, Vermont is short on that. That becomes a crucial thing for the state to think about growing and helping with. We have a lot of labor intensive businesses, or employers, let's know. And we like that. We like our health care, we like education, we like retail and tourism. Those are very hard to introduce in, uh, productivity to because they're labor-centric. More patients in your hospital means more caregivers. You don't hire more robots. You hire more LPNs, more LNAs, more RNs, more doctors, if you can find them. And as we will keep saying, these are long-term challenges. It's taken us a long time to get here, and it's going to take us a long time to get out. We have to think that way. There is no single policy that the legislature can vote tomorrow that will have an impact in 6 to 12 months that will change this. They'd love to. We'd love them to. I think we know by now that won't happen. This is a long-term challenge. And it's not as though Vermont hasn't been thinking about this. Vermont has been. Since at least the 1930s, Vermont has written reports, made studies, had commissions. Uh, there's a stack of them. I've got about that many at home. I did not bring them. But they're fascinating. The one in 1930, Commission on Rural Life, was a book-length study of Vermont immediately following the 1927 floods, which was the time when Vermont began to wake up to the fact that it was no longer an island isolated from the United States. But it was actually part of a nation and needed to begin to think of itself as that. Over all those studies, from 1931 to today, these trends have persevered. There's always been a focus on the land and environment, partly because of our agricultural past, but people have treasured the land. And I suspect that will continue and needs to. That's who we are. There's been a conversation about social and economic justice, fairness, who we are, how we treat each other, what it means to be a neighbor. Those are part of Vermont, and they have been 
since the 19th century, but certainly they've been written down since the 30s. That's part of Vermont. However, in almost all of the studies that I've read, no one really talks about economic opportunity or what it means for the state to grow, what it means for it to be economically strong, what it means for its people to have opportunities, not just to keep doing what they used to do, but to do new and better things, to be employed at higher and more challenging levels, to increase our productivity, our wages, to live better. List of commissions. Those of you who are aware of the Grafton conferences that were held at Wyndham Foundation, the first one in 1984 was actually on economic development in the future of Vermont. I'll talk about that in just a second here because the first one was about the rapid growth that was going on in Vermont in the 1970s and 80s. And the concern was not, hey, this is great, let's keep growing. It was, holy cow, this is a crazy ride, we can't keep doing this. How do we get control of it? And for those of you who are here then, I was not. It was a crazy time. Houses were going up, well, I don't have it in this set, but if you look at our website, you can see when most of the housing was built in Vermont, in the 70s and 80s. That's how fast we were growing. New companies, new people, an influx of flatlanders, new people thinking new ways. The world was changing. And we began to institute policies and practices to control and manage growth. Act 250, which was started in 1970, was more fully implemented. Other things were wrapped around that, including the creation of kind of a mindset about what we wanted. And the good news is they worked. And growth stopped in the mid-90s. And we forgot to turn that off. And we're still not growing. Interestingly, Somebody who had been at our first event, we did one in Wyndham County a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, somebody came up from that came up to me just last week and said, I really appreciate what you said about this slide. He said, as a working engineer who does development work around Vermont, has developed his own projects, he said, this is what I see in towns when I go in to talk about development or permitting. I see uh, development review boards and others who are saying basically, politely, but saying basically to me, either you do this the way we want, A, we're not in a hurry to permit this, do it the way we want, or there will be something else. He said, I can see it in their minds. They think there's another opportunity coming. And I know there isn't, because those things are not happening. The deal that I've got is the one that's going to be in that town for the next 10 years. This is a guy, by the way, who developed the Brooks House in, redeveloped the Brooks House in Brattleboro, which is a major undertaking of an old hotel which had a bad fire four years ago. Marvelous effort. They spent $24 million to redevelop this old 1873 hotel. And the assessed value of the property when it was completed is $8 million. That doesn't compute. That does, that does not work financially. They had to use every possible resource of free money, grants, tax benefits, programs, and they did it. It was an incredibly creative financial thing, much less a construction project. Well, you can't go developing towns that way. We've got to make things economic somehow. That's a real challenge for us. I want to make sure that people understand much as we want to talk about Vermont exceptionalism, every other rural state in the United States has a similar set of challenges. If you were to drop down in the middle of Iowa, they'd be having this meeting. Montana, actually be a little more grim. Idaho, same, a little more grim, except in Boise. Nebraska, Kansas, Kentucky. We're not Appalachia. Imagine what it's like to be in Kentucky. But Vermont did not shift its vision, really. That's the bottom line of all this from the 1980s to now. If you look around the legislature, 
a lot of people who came to it or who bring the values of that time of controlled growth, resistance to employment, to corporations, to capital. And that can get a little too much. We're at a place now where we need to adjust our vision. We don't need to give up on fairness, good treatment of the, economy, of the environment, but we need to adjust our vision to the reality that's around us, which we're not growing. And if we look ahead a few years, we have a very difficult time. So why do we need another try? After all the stack of reports I said, which I'm happy to share with you. Because the tipping point, the quote Mount Gladwell, is visible. Look at our data, and you'll see that the bubble of population is in, the, is in their 50s. The workforce, the bubble of population is in their 50s. 10 years from now, they'll be retiring, and there's no one coming behind them. We had a, uh, both an interesting, even exciting conversation, but a disturbing conversation with someone in the Northeast Kingdom a couple of months ago, who said, I've been around the manufacturing world here in the Northeast Kingdom for 45 years. He's now a professor at London State. He said, the thing that worries me is I go into all of our manufacturing shops and everybody on the floor has gray hair. And the owners are telling me, I don't know what I'm going to do when these guys retire because I can't fill those jobs. And the owner themselves are 60 or 65. And they can't find someone to take over the business from them. So we're looking at it as a place where some of those employers will in fact shut their doors. In 10 years or so, they'll sell the equipment, close the building. Not because they want to, but because they don't have a choice. That's desperate. That's the Northeast Kingdom, and it's worse there than anywhere, which is why the tragedy at Jay and Kubert is so real, because the Northeast Kingdom is deeply challenged. But the workforce is no younger in Wyndham County, or in Bennington County, or in Rutland County. General Electric plant in Rutland that employs a thousand people at good paying, hard working jobs, and GE loves their Vermont employees. They're expecting 500 retirements in the next five years. And they have no idea. They're working hard with the local tech school, with high schools, with anybody. Where do you find 500 people? and get them to the level of skill you need to keep a very highly complex plan operating. That's what we're facing. That's the hidden challenge to us right now. We can't grow because we don't have workforce to, to add to, but we're facing a place where our workforce is going to begin to shrink, and we can't back them. Same, of course, is true with management, which is an even greater challenge, actually. It's very hard to find managers, general managers, owners, capital. The, what's referred to fondly as the alligator mouth in the legislature, the alligator mouth is the difference between state expenses and state revenues. So the last few years, as you've been reading, has, has been real. Every year, the legislature manages to get the pieces together and then they come back in a few months, and it's back again to another 60 or 80 million dollars. Get them together, and then they come back, and it's another 60 to 80 million. So we're not growing. We're not growing opportunity. We're not growing services. We're not growing offerings. We're tightening. We're increasing tax burden or fees, because we have to. But that's not going to get better. That's going to get worse, because if we have fewer taxpayers, either we make them pay more, and, and I don't know how we can. That's going to be a problem. So as I say, not to overstate it too much, this crisis may be devastating to our quality of life. Devastating. So, the Vermont Futures Project is talking about what could be. 
We have built mental models of Vermont. We all carry them in our minds. Legislators, policymakers, opinion makers carry in their minds the ideas of what Vermont should be, agriculture, fairness, independence. We don't want to be New Jersey, which we take personally because Jennifer's from New Jersey. But as Art Wolf showed a few years ago, to be New Jersey, we would have to achieve a level of population density that you could not even imagine. Our population would be 15 or 20 million. So it's not in the cards, but we're, we've been terrified of that. The data we have, that we've shown on vtfuturesproject.org challenges these and says our problem is sustaining ourselves. It's not controlling growth, it's accomplishing some growth. So it's connecting the metal models we have with the data that we can see. That's the challenge we have. So the usual conversations about Vermont's economy are forecasts of doom and gloom or wine and roses. Why should we worry? What are we going to do? Kind of tactical conversations. The solutions tend to be great, great trends and new ideas. Hey, if we just had a little more entrepreneurship or some more software developers or if we had a better food system or more organic food, you know, that would take care of it. That, that would do it. That's what we need. Great ideas. Focus on certain sectors like food, focus on certain strategies, entrepreneurship, focus on our values. So briefly, the project has baseline data, about 90 pieces of data. We've got a dashboard that tells you how we score that. And we have indicators, 30 of those 90, that we think that we've selected to say, here's how we keep track. Here are the things we think need to move in order for Vermont to be stronger, healthier, and have more opportunity. It's just a sample piece of data. This is the age distribution of workforce and scale and size of the workforce. This is Chittenden County, no surprise. You can see that the darker the, the color, the older the workers. In Chittenden County, there's a decent number of people in the sort of 25 to 44 year old, sort of what we expected. But look at some of these others. First of all, they're very small. Secondly, the proportions are really quite different. This is the dashboard. These are these six things, and Steve can testify to this. We had quite a discussion in the board about scoring these. These are not just decorative. We actually selected where to place those needles, and we will do that every year. So the thing to take away from this is that we think that the economy is in what we would call a yellow area. In other words, it's, it's to be worried about. Our entrepreneurship and innovation piece is actually pretty good. We have a very some piece of that, a lot of that going on in Burlington, uh, GW Plastics, GS Precision in, in Brattleboro and some other places. However, workforce and demographics are both in the, in the red, meaning they're to be worried about. They are a potential problem, or in fact, a real problem, as you'll see in a second. Quality of place, of course, we love Vermont. But the quality of place is greatly enhanced and supported by the nature of infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, uh, et cetera. And that's to be worried about. That's in the yellow. We do not invest enough in our infrastructure. We have indicators in each of those, in the pairs of those things. The only thing I want to point out here is that unemployment rate when we did this last October was 3.7%. Most of you know that the app that the Estimated beneficial unemployment rates about 4.8, 4.9% in order to have enough people so that you can hire to grow your company. 3.7 is, is at least a percent below. That makes hiring very tight, and there are lots of open jobs. We were in a bank in Burlington uh, three months ago. Uh, the president was telling us, I've got 900 positions in Vermont, biggest bank in Vermont. I've got 50 openings. 50! Because there's no people that can't hire them. So we ask, what does that mean? So that means I don't have loan officers. I don't have credit analysts. I don't have tellers to keep banks open. So it means my level of service, my ability to be successful, my ability to help my customers is really damaged because I can't find the people to let me do the business 
that can help other businesses grow. That's real. That's a, that's a real thing. It's not speculative. It's not statistical. He's got 50 open jobs now. <coughs> Anybody know what the unemployment rate of Vermont is right now? Uh, it's 3.3%. Uh, 3.3%. So it's gone down. Employment has gotten even tighter. It means more people are working. That's good. But it means if you have a job and you need to hire into it, you're going to have a heck of a time finding that person. <coughs> so the question now is, what does success look like? The uh, dashboard has three pillar pairs. The economy, which is tied to innovation, because innovation drives the economy, right? Schumpeter talked about uh, creative destruction. You have to continue to innovate, even in existing businesses, even the most hidebound. Dairy farms continue to change what they do, even though it's still a cow giving milk. Dairy farms are continuing to work harder at being more productive, due to consuming less labor, because they have to. That's the competitive world. Workforce is driven by the demographics that, that post it. And places are powered as a set of infrastructure. So we think of the three pillar pairs, and you'll be talking in those in a minute. We talked about workforce here. Let me just show you our back of the envelope calculation, and this is just to scare you. So we've been talking for a number of years about the difficulty in the workforce, and we've had programs come out of the state that were, were proposed to do this, like let's let's try and keep some of our college students here in Vermont by paying part of their tuition or offering some uh, support for purchasing a house. Let's try and keep some of the students who come to Vermont, like to Middlebury, keep them in Vermont because they come here, they learn to love it, they want to be here. That'll do it. Here's what we think. We think even if you do all of that and you're successful at it, which we're not particularly, that the demand from retirements and a need for some growth is such that at the end of the day, we need 12,000 new workers a year in Vermont for the foreseeable future. 12,000. It's not 100. It's not 200. It's 12,000. That's the scale of problem that we're facing. Some of you, I hope, are asking yourself the critical question. Where are those people going to live? Because the vacancy rate in Burlington is zero. The vacancy rate in Brownsville is 1%. The affordable, meaning not affordable policy-wise, but affordable for what young people earn, vacancy rate in Brownsville is probably less than 1%, or less than zero because rents are expensive. And in Burlington, they're crazy expensive. So this leads you to see another problem that's really, really critical. How do we get there? What do we have to do? We can't just solve one problem. We have to solve several at the same time. That requires creative thinking. It requires investment. It requires innovation. It requires vision. It requires all of us to be thinking about what we're doing. So, now we're ready to get to work. I get to do the entertainment. <laughs> Jennifer gets to make you work. That's the way it is between us two, I'd like to point out. So. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, we are going to transition to some group work. I'm going to ask you all to stand up and breathe a little, get some coffee, get a beverage, and then see Danielle or me, we're gonna hand you a form, and you're gonna take it back quickly to your, that's Danielle, that's Lauren. You're gonna take it back and you're gonna fill it in. You're gonna have about five minutes. We'll give you a little bit of warning. You're gonna work solo on your personal form, and then your form tells you which group you belong to and then you're gonna move into those groups when we give you the notice. So there are three facilitators. Yep. And Robin Shaw, thank you, is one of them. So if your form says group one, you'll be with Robin. And if your form says
says group two, remind me who's two, thank you, <laughs> Diane, yes. And then group three is Sue Hoxy. So you will look at your form, I'll remind you of who these people are, you have three spaces you're gonna go to. Your form actually looks a little bit different from this, but the basic concept is we just want you to pick one thing that's bothering you, just one. We want you to speak personally about why it's worrying you. So the form guides you through this with some pretty clear instructions, but you'll have a topic. It might be the economy, it might be workforce, and it might be quality of place, your form tells you. And you're gonna pick a problem, and you're gonna talk about why you think it's gonna cause a bigger problem in the future, and then you're gonna to start to think about what it looks like to solve it. What does success look like? And it's really important for us that you just keep this pretty specific and personal. We're not looking for you to think like policymakers. That all happens later. And you will be taking this into your groups and your facilitators will run you through how this is gonna be collected and processed. And, and then I will gather up all of your forms and I will process that information. So it matters to me all the little details that you put in there, every little description, everything that you care about. All right, thank you and stand up. We're gonna give you a few minutes to breathe and then sit on down and work. And, and as he said, this is gonna take some struggle and some work and getting used to having those kinds of conversations that are a little challenging and a little different and uh, is kind of what we're trying to get at. So I hope that it was enjoyable but also a little bit of awkward because uh, I think that's how we're gonna go forward together, having some hard conversations. So Jeff's gonna sort of facilitate as each of the groups reports out and then a little bit of commentary. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is group number one, the economy. Um, a couple of different ones that maybe were in opposition to one another, or maybe not exactly aligned, but that's good. Everybody had things. Um, do you, how much time, do you want me to actually read all of these, or what, what do you want me to do, talk about five themes? Minutes, five minutes. Okay, so all right. So we had a number of um, visions that related to supporting small business and entrepreneurial ventures, um, encouraging entrepreneurial and small businesses so that people and families are more active and involved. So there was a lot of tying of um, the business world with our population. That, that came in in a number of different ways. Um, that it, we need to make Vermont and the business community attractive and interesting so young people will be here uh, in a number of ways. And we also talk a lot about housing. Um, one person's vision was that the housing market has some level of competition and turnover. Um, and somebody else around housing said, um, the average Vermonter is younger, has more job choices, and spends less of her income on housing. I've kind of described a, a bit of it there. Vermont is an affordable place to work, live, and retire. Um, Pro-business approaches to create new jobs and new industry. Um, that citizens and town select boards have become more involved and the placement of solar panels, wind, and other renewable energy are such that it's attractive for people to come to Vermont. So we had that and we also had solar panels on every rooftop. So we would have a, a number of energy related, renewable energy related things. Um, a bunch about transportation, both uh, rail uh, here in the Western Corridor, um, electronic electric vehicles, more imaginative public transit, uh, better advanced, developed advanced transportation. Uh, talk about young people. Uh, a tapestry of small farms successfully feeding their neighbors. I can see that. <laughs> um, Again, people are able to choose employment that supports them and allows time for personal and community quality of life. So there was a lot about um, job choices, not just slotting people in, but that, that people actually have choices, uh, which is important. Streamlined regulations and lower taxes relative to our neighboring states, so some sort of competitive advantage. That was mentioned a couple of different ways, so leading to higher economic growth. Um, that economic sustainability is purposeful, more inconsistent with our uh, other values of social justice, fairness, environment, uh, and all of that, but it's not just growth for the sake of growth, but there's some meaning behind it. Um, that we have a flourishing network of entrepreneurs, capital providers, and advisors who are all helping each other. And young people have strong basic education and access to continuing education. So, 
we talked about a lot of those things, young people, transportation, jobs, better paying jobs, choice of jobs, competitive advantage, energy education, housing. Um, one thing we thought was a little bit missing was this access to capital. I, I wrote it as hard, of hard to fund but important projects. And this actually came about when we were discussing the Brooks House. Uh, I think that that struck a chord with people. As, you know, imagine in downtown Middlebury that the Tell Block goes up in flames and maybe a couple of buildings with it. And how much that would cost to put that together, which is what, what you could actually get to fund it and how hard that would be. And you had some people with deep pockets in addition to getting lots of funds. But that's a scary thing. I mean, how is that going to work for people? So we realized that was kind of missing. Okay? I did, group, did I, is there anything else that you wish I had said that I didn't? It's a great group. Okay. <laughs> One, the round tables. It's I have a great group too. <laughs> um, I'm going to summarize uh, the vision of our group members in my code, and then I'll get to our summary. Um, increase the population and expand opportunities for all ages. Employers using adult learners and increasing opportunities in training and internships. Parents earning enough to raise their children in a safe and secure environment. All workforce, regardless of age, um, has an opportunity in advanced technology. College graduates either return or stay. Um, this was interesting. Developing an import-export bank for intellectual capital. And I think that relates to telecommuting and other things of that nature. Um, Opportunity to provide multiple right-sized and growing businesses. Another reference to youth staying, not only college, but also high school, returning or staying. Producing a healthy workforce um, in collaboration with primary care physicians and the challenges of things like addiction. Uh, threat, creating thriving businesses that are balanced with the landscape, guaranteeing jobs for uh, college grads, specifically CCB for some reason, I don't know. Um, you know, and then maybe expanding that need to the state colleges. Um, creating, a vibrant, creating vibrant communities with active civic life, um, fostering interesting new businesses. I'm trying to read my writing. Um, either businesses that stay or move here and bring jobs. Okay. Um, creating community schools that provide care from birth to five that may also provide multi-generational opportunities for services, um, including things like mental health. Uh, keeping young people staying in Vermont, um, supporting younger farmers, uh, having more affordable housing, and increasing co-housing models. Apparently, Vermont is number one in the country of co-housing opportunities. And last in our individual visions, creating healthy small towns with diverse age ranges, being able to live and work together. And so then I asked, are there any gaps? So we've had a couple gaps. One is when we talk about the skilled workforce, there's high-tech skills, but there's also other industries that you may not need a college degree, facility skills. So we should be talking about workforce in the entire spectrum of the workforce. Also, when we're talking about the workforce, that we should keep in mind the diversity of the workforce in terms of age, that we have a balance between all the ages of the workforce. The other thing that was missing was, um, how do we get there? What are the pathways? So it's, it, it's a complex system. How do we educate? How do we train? How do we develop skills? And even having a vision to see ahead, well, I want to be this, so how do I get there? So we talked about apprenticeships and internships and things like that. Um, last but not least, you know, 
having a partnership between employers who actually have real jobs and employees that want to work and maybe more opportunities on site for training on site. Um, you know, hiring somebody that may not have everything you want, but you get them on site and you provide some support and they flourish into that person you're looking for. And that's our Does anyone in my group think I forgot something? Uh, good job. <laughs> Great, thanks, Diane. Um, so our group was quality of place, and we touched on many of the things that the other two groups had reported out. Um, but things that uh, I got it. Thanks. Um, so things that you might expect that we talked about were solar fields, uh, keeping them out of the path of travelers. Um, affordable, I'm sorry, access to affordable childcare, uh, large box store developments, Act 251 permitting process, uh, renewable energy and block care for our pastoral landscapes, uh, climate change, and uh, addiction-free families. So those were some of the, the primary themes that came out of quality of place. So as we boiled it down, uh, I first asked what's missing, and uh, we also talked about kind of um, not, students shouldn't feel pressured to always go on to college, that there are plenty of good paying jobs that don't require a college degree. Um, so just the skilled workforce. Uh, and then we talked about connectivity too, so that's the other thing that is still missing in this state. Not everybody has great uh, cell coverage, internet coverage, broadband, you name it. Um, so as we talk about healthy growth, we feel like we should have programs that cover their costs. So often we're, we're creating all these great initiatives, but they cost more um, than, than the um, value. Um, we talked about reimagining the school system, so for example, Middlebury College has the J-term internships. Um, so treat the, the school breaks like kids are out of school this week. So create a, a short-term internship for those students, connect them with employers, and then there's another um, inflow into the workforce. Um, Reimagine or redefine what is beautiful and valuable to us. We talked about that Brooks, is it Brooks House? Is that, okay. We talked about that also, you know, $24 million investment in, in a property that has $8 million value. Was that the best use of that money? Do we need to redefine what is, is beautiful? Um, and, and, you know, can, should we let go of some of those uh, emotion tied to historical buildings? I know we kind of face some of that in Middlebury with um, a lot of folks wanting to hang on to the old town offices. Um, and also availability of affordable housing. So, group, did I did I miss anything? All right. So you did perfectly, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so what I like is the question that a couple of you asked clearly, and I think I'll probably try to get to, but it's what's missing. But here's we've got just a few minutes, but I want to use these few minutes to do two things. First to point out, as you probably figured out in your groups, that these three sets of pillars are in fact connected. A healthy economy is driven by innovation, which is in turn driven by a healthy and innovative workforce that has a lot of intellectual capital and drive, which is supported by a demographic or a population that has a lot of energy in it, young people, it's continually refreshing itself, which is attracted by quality of place, which is supported by high quality, well-developed infrastructure. So, you can follow the logic this way, you can follow it this way, saying investment in infrastructure leads to quality of place, leads, leads to growing population, which leads to a healthy and growing workforce, which leads to innovation, which leads to a healthy economy. These things are all connected. We don't make these decisions in a silo. So given a couple of minutes, Summary comments. Now that you've heard the group's report, you've had some experience of thinking about vision yourself. 
what do you see? What, what, do you have summary comments? Do you have something that jumps to mind you either didn't get to say, you think we all miss, or that you'd really like, to, there's, mm -hmm. yes? Um, I forgot this. We didn't say it, but I was thinking it, and the word is mentors. Is what? Mentors. Mentors. <laughs> And, but I have to ask, when you, when you talk about mentors, who are they mentoring? And if our workforce is aging and shrinking, who are they mentoring? I was thinking of that when you talked about the, the factory that was going to close, if everyone was going to retire. Um, you know, maybe apprenticeship is one avenue, but maybe going into high school and even letting children know that these positions exist in our communities. There, that's, that's a necessary thing we should say. We had a striking, where's Jennifer? Oh, there you are. Jennifer and I had a fascinating experience uh, in Loyal County several months ago. This was, I remember I talked about the bank that had 50 openings? So in the morning of that day, we were talking with a bank in Burlington that had 50 openings that day. Four hours later, we were in Johnson in a class of seniors, asking them, talking about some other things, but asking them, what are you going to do when you graduate? Well, I'm, I'm going to work in J.P. or I'm going to really what I really want to do is get a job at CVS because they've got a national network of stores and I can transfer and go to a place and work up in the corporation and grow. Not a what? And leave. They want to leave. Not a one of them mentioned working in a bank in Vermont where there were jobs available today, that very day. So, to your there's a lack of information moving around. But even with that. I think we have to be very clear, and that's the reason I did the back of the envelope. The numbers still don't work. We need new people in Vermont, is my view. And how do we get them here? So, that's, so we need to provide all those things, mentoring, apprenticeships, internships, but we need the bodies to, to drive those. We gotta go find them. Pretty proud. Sorry. Right, over here, that was one. Yeah, I'm just wondering, that seems pretty clear to me. Does, does our legislature understand that, in your view? Far be it for me to judge. <laughs> it is, after all, the Greater General Court of Vermont. We'll certainly have that conversation as we go along. Look, I, to be clear, it's very hard when you're in the middle of a legislative session lasting January to early May, and you have huge problems to address. No staff to think this way. It's very hard. I, I have to say that. I know. I know legislators well, Robin's going to be one, I hope, but it's harder than heck to be one of those people. That's why we need to provide this vision. So thank you for the question. Um, right here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so I'm, I'm going to contradict both of the last two things, um, which is, partially, I, what I get from the bank thing is not necessarily that we need more people, but that we need to be thinking about this in a way that we match what we have with what we have. And that it's not necessarily growing jobs, growing more people. We have the jobs, we have the people, we're not connecting them. And that, that might be really clear in one way, it's a way we're used to thinking, but is there a different way that maybe we should be thinking about this that balances our resources with what we, with the people that we have, with the planet that we have, such that we're not overstepping in ways that are not healthy for either us or the rest of the yeah. world, which is a little different paradigm. No, that's, that's yes. why it's not simple. That's why it's not simple. Yep. No, and that's the kind of conversation we need to have. And, and one of the, it's, it's really easy for, not easy, it's really natural for us to start talking about strategies and solutions, and yes, they're important, and we worry about them all day. That's, but part of this is, imagine you took these lists, and a genie in a bottle popped into this room and said, all right, that's all you get. Is it good enough yet? Like, I don't think we're, we're not there. And, and you know, that's, what I'm, that's kind of what we're trying to get at, is did we put on the page everything we want? You know, so 20 years ago we said we want a lot of solar panels, and we maybe didn't come to the conclusion about where we wanted them and why. 
And so that's why we're kind of in the place where we are. So we've got to keep rehashing it. It's never perfect. Which one of the better? Yeah. First attack. Uh, I think Vermont needs more uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> uh, you know, we all like things the way they are, but doing things just because that's the way we've always been doing them is a very bad reason to continue that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a high challenge. No, that, that's real and that's a high challenge. We're going to run out of battery, so we're just going to talk. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a real and high So the question is, did we challenge ourselves enough here? And I don't know. I mean, it's, this last question is a really profound one that can dig down to pretty far. I think, I think one other uncomfortable question is why are wages flat when we have an undersupply of workers? You would think that the laws of supply and demand would push wages up. And for some reason, that doesn't seem to be happening, including banks. That, that's right. That, that's right. It, one of the answers to that may be that in Vermont, people, while well, pe some people leave, not everybody does, which means you've got a limited and trapped market. But, that, but you're right. But that question is real across the United States, right? Stagnant wages, rising profits. One of the issues of, of having conversations that you discussed is the fact that we stigmatize people that are low socioeconomic and people that have real mental health issues and all these things. Do you think these folks are a great resource, really, if they weren't stigmatized? And uh, those are some of the conversations that need to be made. We, have, uh, we do have a great workforce available if they weren't pigeonholed. Yeah, <coughs> that needs to be done. Whether there's enough in there, one of the great truths about Vermont, for instance, is that occasionally people talk, oh, we just get older people to work, Dave. But it turns out that most people over 65 who want to work are, in fact, working. So it's not, it's not in fact, there. So we're already doing those things. Do we need to continue to help folks? Absolutely. Is that enough? No. We've got to do more. I like the uncomfortable. I like this. Was there one? Is there another one? Yes, sir. No. Oh, sorry. Over here. So, um, we have a huge population of young a young workforce, and they have young children, and it's impossible for them to work without high-quality affordable child care. Child care. I mean, I went last year. I spent twenty-two thousand dollars on child care, and you add a thousand dollars to my to that with my student loans. It doesn't make sense for me to go to work mm -hmm. and pay that yeah. when I can um, push my loans out, you know, for the next couple of years until my children are older. Okay, we need to wrap up because it's just about here. So, um, with disclosure, I'm from New Hampshire, so sorry, but, uh, right there. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the organization I work works across four states, so we're in a number of different or, uh, conversations like this, and the biggest thing that I take away from these is that states are not parochial, those, those fixed barriers do not exist, and sometimes it's more interesting to look at labor market areas, because these boundaries are so transferable, we are exporting people to work in other places from different states, people are working elsewhere, uh, and transporting into the state. So, for example, Norwich, I think, is the highest per capita income town in Vermont, correct? And probably most of the workforce there is coming from across the border in New Hampshire. Yeah. So I think that part of this conversation really needs to be thinking more broadly, not just about Vermont, and I think having a vision is great, but with 600,000 people, it's a very steep hill to climb when looking at a sustainable long-term economy when our borders are not fixed, and it not just goes east west, it goes to our Canadian friends to the north. Or, or part of the vision has to include those edges. Right. Exactly. And, and to that point, you know, one of the things we've been looking at is how on earth can we keep having more and more jobs and not more and more workers? There are a lot of answers to that, um, but one of them is a steady, a steady rise in the importation of labor, which is fine in a way, but it's sort of, you know, if you're going to have a job creation focus as your top policy, at a certain point you have to ask yourself, well, why? Like, what's the point of that if it's not really about growing Vermont's economy or balancing Vermont's economy? So that's all these things have to happen together, or we're kind of... And just to say, Jennifer's actually working on this, but there's a, there's a really interesting conversation going between uh, Wyndham County, Vermont, Franklin County, Massachusetts, and Cheshire County, New Hampshire, because they share a labor shed, and they're, be they're beginning to talk amongst themselves on, for just that reason. Yeah, and we're involved in that project, so that's the type of thing that I think okay. is fantastic. We need, we got time for one more. I think we could also look at um, maybe some innovative economic models, like Gardner Supply is a worker-owned co-op. Yeah. And there are people that want to work in those types of places, and they'll come from other states to do it. 
Absolutely, and innovative succession planning as well that goes with that. That is, how do we deal with some of those companies like the Northeast Kingdom where the ownership is aging and can't figure out what to do? How do we help with that process? But, yes? Um, I think when talking about attracting people to the state, you need to look at millennials and what millennials want. And I think that that has changed from our parents' generation. They're not driven by high salaries. They don't want the big jobs. But they don't want to work the nine to five. So I think that might be why you're seeing that there's a few open spots in things. But people don't want to work in them because they want the flexibility to do other things. So that's something that you need to think about. I think well. that's right. But I also think that you need to have a variety of opportunities for people to fit whatever their needs are, whether they want to be non-9 to 5 or non local or where they want to be. No, I want to have a a career type ladder opportunity process. We, we need to do all that. All right, before Jeff wraps it up, don't stop. That's it. Send me things. Email me. I collect all of this. I really do. Because every single new word makes us think differently about this stuff. And this is what we're struggling with. So thank so you. So this is, this is actually the wordle created from the input from the last session we did. So we do keep track of all this. We keep every word that we can track that is written on the small papers, on the big ones. And that will feed into uh, our overall document. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll be in touch. Thank you very much for the time. We really appreciate it.